Matthew uh, 26, verse 29 says, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Mark 14, verse 25 says, Verily I say unto you, I'll drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And Luke 22, verse 18 says, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. So the three Gospels that contain you know, a description of the bread and wine at the Last Supper all contain this declaration by Jesus, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom. And we want to home in on those words this morning. Well, you know, why does Jesus make that declaration? We must have read those words literally hundreds of times, often on a Sunday morning. But have you ever thought about the meaning behind them? Why does he declare that he will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom. In Luke uh, 22, verse 16, Jesus states he won't eat the Passover generally until the kingdom, but he makes specific mention of the wine part of that feast, obviously, in verse 18, but not the bread when it comes to uh, verse 19. And that pattern's repeated in, in Matthew and Mark. So both only mention Jesus no longer drinking wine. So the, the emphasis is particularly on the wine and not the bread. I think we're probably familiar with the sort of double symbology of the cup that we're about to drink from this morning. So Jesus himself tells us in, in uh, verse 20, as Daryl read, that the wine represents his blood. But blood is really also a symbol, isn't it? So literal blood, you know, even Jesus' literal blood, despite what the, the Catholics might say, is really of no value. The valuable thing is the life that the blood represents. So we know that the fruit of the vine, the wine, represents Jesus' blood. And we sort of take it for granted that you know, we are you know, drinking symbolically the blood of Jesus Christ. But think you know, for a moment how weird that really is. Naturally speaking, blood is not something that's appealing to drink at all, as far as I know, especially human blood. So under the law, you know, even before the law, in fact, God forbade the consumption of blood. And in fact, you know, the very place that this symbology is explained for us, you know, blood represents life, is the place where the consumption of blood is forbidden. So God told Noah hundreds of years before the law of Moses was given, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, life is blood, shall ye not eat. So blood represents life, but don't eat the blood. And these you know, principles are reinforced in the law, in, in Leviticus 17, verse 11 and 12. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you. you know, words echoed at the Last Supper. These, you know, this blood I've, I've given to you, this, this bread I've given to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. Therefore, I said unto the children of Israel, no soul of you shall eat blood. So again, blood represents life. Don't eat the blood. So the same law given to Noah you know, gets reinforced over and over in the law of Moses. No eating, or, you know, really drinking of blood. And so that became you know, fixed in the Jewish psyche, didn't it, over the centuries. In addition to you know, most people's natural aversion to eating blood, no, normal people, that is, of course, not, not Scottish people, obviously. The Jewish people were very careful, and still are, in the way that animals are killed, to ensure that all the blood was drained from the carcass. So drinking blood was absolutely abhorrent to the Jewish mind. So for 2,000 years, drinking blood gets you know, explicitly banned by God. And then along comes Jesus and says, drink my blood. So no wonder that they were you know, shocked, you know, appalled at his teaching. In, in John chapter 6, Jesus says to them in John chapter 6 and verse 53, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So again, this connection between blood and life. You know, two, two and a half thousand years of don't drink blood, don't drink blood, don't drink blood. And then along comes Jesus and says, drink blood. In fact, drink my human blood. 
So what changed? What, what did God say? Why did God say for 2,500 years, don't drink blood? And then suddenly say, if you don't drink blood, then you'll have no life in you. Did God change his mind after 2,500 years? Was that 2,500 years a mistake? Well, it wasn't God that changed, was it? It was the blood that changed. The blood in Genesis and Leviticus is the blood of bulls and goats. The blood in John chapter 6 is the blood of the Son of God. So the symbology of drinking blood represents absorbing the life of the bleeder, for want of a better term, into our lives. There's no virtue in absorbing animal blood into our lives, is there? The sort of amoral life of an animal, even a physically blemishless animal, is of no benefit to us. Their blood can't take away our sins, as Hebrews 10 verse 4 tells us. But then, along comes Jesus. A perfect life, a sinless life, a moral life, a life of value to God. Now that's a life worth drinking, says God, absorbing into our own bodies and generating new life within us. So it wasn't God that changed, but it was the blood that changed. And this is beginning to hint at why Jesus does not share the memorial wine with us this morning. The blood represented here this morning is his. Now you notice um, in Luke 22 that Jesus says that he won't drink of the fruit of the vine. He doesn't say, I, I won't drink wine. Now we know that they're exactly the same thing. The fruit of the vine is wine. But Jesus' use of fruit and vine does, I, I think, really give us a key as to what exactly he's driving at in this you know, self-imposed ban. And ironically, I think the, the answers to this sort of little puzzle are, are mostly found in the gospel message that doesn't you know, even contain this actual declaration. John, John is the only gospel that doesn't tell us that Jesus will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine, but it's also the gospel that explains all this symbology to us. If you've got your Bible open there, come to John chapter 15. So John chapter 15, uh, these are words spoken only hours before Jesus' crucifixion. His, his mortal mission is almost accomplished. And then it's you know, only you know, three days before his resurrection to immortality. And only six weeks before he then ascends you know, to his Father in heaven. So John chapter 15, I'm just going to emphasise various words as we read through this and hopefully you'll sort of uh, pick up on the message here. John 15, uh, verse 1. I am the true vine, so that's Jesus speaking here, so he's the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. So different roles. Jesus is the vine, his father is the husbandman. Every branch, that's us, in me that beareth not fruit, so the emphasis on the fruit of the branch of the vine, Every branch that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. So that's an interesting phrase at the end of verse 5, isn't it? Without me ye can do nothing. Not a bit, or maybe a bit less than you expected. Not, you know, you can do most of it, but you'll need me for the last, you know, 10% or so. But without me ye can do nothing. N not a thing. Verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into fire and they are burned. If ye abide with me and my words abide with you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. And what's the fruit he's expecting? Verse 9, as my Father loved me, so I have loved you. Continue. Same word as abide, abide ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, 
even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain, same word as abide, might abide in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. So the answers are really all here, aren't they? Jesus is the true vine, verse 1 and verse 5. We are the branches, in verse 2 and verse 5. The intention is for us to bear fruit, and that is the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 2, verse 4, verse 5, verse 8. And the key fruit, the real fruit of the Spirit, is love. Verse 9, verse 10, verse 12, verse 13. But the method is the important thing here. The method through which we remain attached to the true vine, the nutrients, you know, the vine stock feeds through to the branches are Christ's words, his commandments, his love and his joy. So it's in verse 7 and verse 9 and verse 11 and verse 12 and verse 14. So these are the things, uh, these four things that make us abide in him. So how do you turn water into wine? Well, you can feed it through a grapevine. So Jesus did that miracle once, didn't he? Back in John chapter 2. He changed water into wine at the wedding uh, you know, of Cana. And yet, you know, it really is a miracle that occurs every year, you know, around this time of year, February, March, in the Barossa, slightly later in McLaren Vale, Coonawarra. Uh, water is absorbed by vines through the year, produces fruit on the branches, and the fruit is crushed, and in the hands of a you know, oenologist becomes wine. So in performing that miracle at the wedding of Cana, turning water into wine, Christ is demonstrating that he is the true vine. He is the converter of water into wine, which is you know, the vine's job. If water represents the word, Jesus' commandments, as he terms it in John 15, then the fruit of the vine represents that word absorbed by someone, absorbed by us, meditated on, processed, uh, and the outcome of that is in the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy are the two key ones that Jesus mentions here, but the others as well in in, uh, uh, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5. Peace, these all you know, become crushed to become wine. So the word of God is only of value once it's been processed by humans. It's only of value when its principles are seen in someone's life. That's the production of fruit, isn't it? Without that, we could easily be cut off and burned and it, and it wouldn't really matter. For that to happen, it has to be read and meditated upon and, and finally applied in one's life's decisions and words and actions. So what does all this mean in relation to Jesus' declaration that he will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God? So again, the symbology is sort of simple enough. The fruit of the vine, which is wine, which represents blood, which represents life. We're the branches of the vine. And so here's the key thing. We receive life from the vine, don't we? We're attached to the vine. The vine absorbs the the water and sends it out to the branches, which is us. We receive life from the vine. Without that life, we are dead. If we become separated, if a branch becomes separated from the vine, we're dead. Without that life, we can produce no fruit, none at all. The point is that our life, you know, this water in the natural symbology of the vine comes from Christ. And here's the whole point, I think, of Jesus not drinking wine until the kingdom. At that last supper, which is really the first supper of of many memorial suppers to come, he is no longer the consumer of that wine, that blood, that life. He is the producer of it. That's what he's trying to tell us, I think. I'm not drinking this life with you anymore. In fact, the life that you are drinking from now comes from me, says Christ. I'm no longer the receiver of life. I am the giver of life. This wine is a gift from me to you as my branches. 
in not drinking the wine, he wants to remind us of his new status. He wants to remind us that our life now comes from him. So from the time of his death and, and resurrection, Jesus was no longer going to be the receiver of life, but a giver of life. We become the recipients of that life that he supplies, and so we drink the wine provided by him. Now, we might be you know, tempted to vaguely sort of think that we fellowship with Christ by sharing this bread and wine with him this morning, just like he did at the Last Supper. But that was the last supper that he would share with his disciples. And that's not what he says, is it? He isn't sharing the bread and wine with us this morning. He is the bread and wine. We fellowship with him by taking his flesh and blood in symbol, his life, into us. And because, of course, we're doing that all together this morning, we are fellowshipping with each other. Christ is not sharing the bread and wine with us this morning. He is the bread and wine. So back to this you know, symbol, this uh, idea of, of wine and blood and life. Now we know that God is the ultimate source of life, don't we? Especially immortal life. 1 Timothy 6.16 tells us about God who only hath immortality, dwelling in light which no man can approach. So God is the source of you know, God is the source of life and God is the source of his word. Jesus received that word, that life, from his Father. In John 14, verse 10, Christ says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but of the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. So every word he spoke, every work he did uh, during his mortal life came from God. He was the receiver of those things from the Father. He was the receiver of life from his Father. But then his status changes. John 17 verse 8, in speaking to his Father, Jesus says, For I have given unto them, that, that's us, his disciples, the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee. For they have believed that thou didst send me. So he was the recipient of words from his father and now we are the recipient of those words from him. And now, in immortality, uh, Christ has become the provider of the word, of life, to us. John 5, verse 26. For as the father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the son to have life in himself. So Christ is now our source of life. Paul describes him as a, um, in the King James Version in 1 Corinthians 15, a quickening spirit. He's not just a quick spirit, he's not just alive, but he is quickening, he is, he is life-giving. He is our source of water. So John 7 verse 37, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. So just as a branch drinks from the vine stock, so we come to drink from him. He is the provider of of the words of life and the spirit as the next verse in John John 7 verse 39 goes on to say but this he spake of the spirit which they that believe on him should receive so the symbols you know really become quite blurred don't they fruit of the vine wine you know blood life water the spirit the word the fruit of the spirit they're all you know very fundamentally linked ideas all different ways of God really saying be more like my son, live like he did, love like he did and does, receive his words, listen to his words, live his words, live his example. And you know who is now helping us to be more like his son? Well, it's his son, isn't it? Christ's role now as the vine is to do everything he can with the power that he's received from his father to influence us to become more like himself. His job as the vine stock is to pump the branches full of life. Life, again, that he is no longer a recipient of, but a provider of. No longer a receiver, but a giver. Luke 22, verse 18 again. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. So it wasn't long. Uh, less than 24 hours after Jesus uttered these words, that Jesus was crucified. 
So can you see him there, hanging on the cross? There's no doubt that God intended him to look to all intents and purposes like a tree. So Peter even uses the word tree instead of cross uh, in Acts. But what sort of tree does he most resemble? Uh, hanging on the stake with you know, both arms outstretched on the cross member. Can you see him? Doesn't he look like a trellised vine, a stock with two branches stretched out? And what fruit do we expect from this vine? We expect grapes, don't we? We expect wine. John 19, verse 34, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith there came out blood and water. The fruit of this vine was blood, representing life, represented in turn this morning by wine. In crucifixion, he became the true vine. So Christ is the true vine. We are the branches of that vine. In the natural, the water goes up through the vine stock and there to the branches which use that to produce fruit. And that's what Christ, I think, is reminding of us, us of when he says, I'll no longer drink of the fruit of the vine. He is now the source of life for us. He doesn't need to drink of that life, represented in the, in the, you know, the cup we have this morning, because he has it in himself now. We need to drink of it, realising that it is from him, directly from him, that our new life comes. We are drinking in his life. He is providing us life. Back in uh, John chapter 15, if you're still there, what is, what is Christ's key message for us in describing himself as the true vine? We've got that repeated word, don't we, abiding. The key is for us as branches to remain attached to the vine that is Christ. It's our relationship with him that is key. He is the vine and we as the branches remain attached to him. What doesn't he say in John 15? He doesn't say that the vine is the ecclesia. He doesn't say that the vine is your family. He doesn't say the vine is your friends or your brothers and sisters. He doesn't even say that the vine is God. In fact, you know, God's clearly got a different role in this analogy as the husbandman. So our relationship to God is now through his son. God hasn't changed. He's still the father. He's still supreme. He still wants a relationship with us as he has since you know, Genesis chapter 1. But that relationship is now through his son. I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me, Jesus says in John 14. So Jesus' statement that he is not drinking this wine with us this morning is to remind us of his new position. Through him we walk in newness of life. He has become the giver of life to us. So how does that work exactly? How does Jesus provide us with life? Is it just a you know, symbol or a ritual thing that we do each Sunday morning? Of course it isn't. The wine is just a symbol. But what it represents is very real. But we have to translate this symbol into reality. Otherwise, it is uh, just a ritual. The symbol, the wine, is just to make us remember because we're so prone to forgetting what is really happening. And what is really happening is that Christ is giving us life now. Christ has really taken the place of his Father in relation to the affairs of this world. So Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power, all of it. John has a similar theme in John 17, verse 2, in, in Christ's prayer to his Father. As there has given him power, himself, Jesus, power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as there has given him. So power over all flesh. And Jesus is now the giver of life, giver of eternal life. John 16, verse 15, all things that the Father hath are mine. All things. So God has delegated all power to him. Jesus is saying that he's not drinking wine with us this morning. He is saying my role is changing. 
I want you to remember me not just as the mortal man I once was, but as what I'm about to become, the all-powerful ruler of heaven and earth. I want you to see me every Sunday morning or whenever we take the emblems in my new role, a giver of life, moral life, and soon uh, immortal life, physical life eternal. As a mortal man, Jesus spake the words his father had given him. He did the works that his father gave him. And now we have the same relationship with him. We speak his words, we keep his commandments. You know, once Christ was the recipient of commands which he obeyed, now he is the issuer of commands which we obey. He provides the wine and we drink of it. Paul puts it this way in, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 and 10. But ye are not of the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So notice how in, in verse 9 he refers to the spirit of God and then immediately calls it the spirit of Christ in the same verse. It's not that they're different spirits, they're the same, but the spirit that we receive is from Christ and we receive it in symbol this morning when we drink the wine. John 17 verse 8, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. The mortal Jesus received the word from his Father, now he gives that to us. So how does it all work? How, how, how does this actually happen then? What's the process of our drinking wine this morning, wine provided by Jesus himself, you know, what's that supposed to remind us of? How does Jesus Christ, to whom all power in heaven and earth has been given, how does he provide the life that we receive? Well, it happens in lots of ways. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 24 tells us that Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. So just as Moses delivered the old covenant to Israel, so Christ does for us now. He ensures that we have received the new covenant. He ensures that not only do we receive it, but that we understand it. In Ephesians 1 verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So the new covenant is life from him to us. We have the words of Jesus himself, the, you know, the actual words that he spoke in the Gospels, don't we? But more than that, he wrote directly to the seven ecclesias in, in Revelation 2 and 3 and gives you know, an amazing prophecy in the rest of that book. Those, those words are life, as he told us in John 6, from him to us. Jesus is ensuring that his words are not just sentences on a page. He's delivering God's message straight to us, you know, where it's needed, straight, you know, injected straight into our hearts and our minds in Hebrews 10 verse 16. This is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. So we have his example in many ways more powerful in his words, the fruit of the spirit in action. You know, we can see how he acted and how he responded to so many different situations in the Gospels. We've got his inmost emotions explained for us in the Psalms and in the Prophets. And we've got his example that we might follow in his steps, as uh, 1 Peter 2 tells us. That's all him providing us life. We have his direction of our own lives through providence. Revelation 1 tells us that he walks among the ecclesias. He observes, but he also directs. He intercedes in our lives, as Romans 8 verse 27 tells us. He makes intercession for the saints. He sends us messengers, sometimes angels, you know, now his servants, as Hebrews 1 tells us, but no doubt often in the form of brothers and sisters in time of need or support. So that direction, that support is life from him to us. He's promised us in Hebrews 13 verse 5 that he will never leave us or forsake us. He is with us till the end of the world in Matthew 28 and verse 20. Nothing can separate us from his love in Romans 8 verse 39. 
So he's, he's not our absent Lord. He's with us here this morning. And that is life from him to us. So in all these ways, he is continuously feeding us with, with wine, with blood, with water, with the word, with his spirit, whatever metaphor you choose to use. So again, we're about to drink of this fruit of the vine. We're about to take his life, the life of the true vine, into ourselves. So we're about to drink that that wine and and take his life into ourselves. And it's through that process and only that process that we will become fruitful branches. A branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. Christ is not drinking this fruit of the vine with us this morning. He is the fruit of the vine for us this morning, that life giving uh, water from the vine to the branches so that we might produce the fruit. He's here, but he's not sharing this cup with us. He wants us to remember when we drink that this wine, this blood, this life comes from him directly. It's a gift from him to us. So why does he say that he won't drink it until the kingdom? What, what happens in the kingdom that changes things? Well, in short, everything changes. So the, the main purpose, of course, of the memorials that we share this morning is remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus says. So we've got the word memorial and remembrance and memory. So it's all that same you know, Latin root word, memor, to call to mind. So Jesus wants us, in the absence of physically seeing him here this morning, he wants us to think about him. Remember him. Remember that even though we can't see him, he is here to memorialise what he did and what he continues to do for us. It's not for his benefit, of course, but for ours. So, you know, feeble and pathetic are we, so easily do we forget, or at least take for granted, the man who gave himself for our salvation, that we need to do this every week to ensure that we reconnect with him. As we've seen, he's ever present to connect with us. The problem is at our end. In the kingdom, there won't be that problem, will there? He'll be physically, visibly with us. And we will no longer be weak and forgetting and ungrateful mortals, for this corruptible will have put on incorruption. So when we drink this cup this morning, as we're about to do, Christ wants us to remember that he is not drinking with us, to remind us that he is now the provider, the source uh, of that water that goes into the branches to produce the fruit of the vine. He is the source of the wine, the blood, the life, the spirit that we are now consuming. We've been fed with moral immortality now from the vine, but in the kingdom, of course, we will be morally and physically immortal, sharing that nature with the vine through whom we have received it. He won't need then to remind us through symbols anymore. Our fellowship with him will be full in every sense, both moral and physical. We will have life in ourselves. Staying in conclusion in the writings of John, 1 John 3 verse 2. Behold, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is.